Well, thank you, Hans, and ladies and gentlemen. My God, I get up here, I have to stare at Dewey Dane and a bull right in front of me all this time. I, <laughs> I don't know that I'm prepared to, uh, uh, I won't get into that anymore. It's a, it's a privilege to, uh, to be here. I thought about why I'm, I'm here. Uh, it's already made clear, I may be the uh, most experienced person in Dewey Dane celebrations over the years. I, uh, I thought sitting here that when I first met Dewey some decades ago, he was 30% older than I am. We reduced that gap. He's only 8% older than I am now. <laughs> I, uh, and I think my privilege of being here first is uh, because I'm the nearest thing to contemporary Dewey has here. I notice a certain amount of gray hair around the table or no hair, but I don't think any of them uh, match either Dewey or myself, and I'm getting close to him. I think my function, presumably, is to provide a little perspective. And you know, there's a certain temptation as you get into four score years and more to say, I've seen it all before. And there's a certain uh, temptation to say that. There's a certain repetition character, repetitive character in what's going on. Uh, feelings of uh, confidence, getting into exuberance, getting into uh, risk-taking, eventually ending up in collapse, and you go through a cycle all over again. And uh, that's true, but I, I must say there, we are in a situation that I think it's safe to say I, I have never seen before in all its complexity, and I don't even think Dewey has ever seen it before in all its uh, complexity. You know, what is unique about it. Uh, I thought those words that Hans uh, read were remarkably prescient. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if you just made them up, but there's several things that I think make this unique. One is I, I do think this financial crisis and now economic crisis uh, grew out of some very serious and prolonged imbalances in the international economy that you're all familiar with. This. Uh, over-saving, or at least very large saving in China and much of Asia and other countries, a lack of savings in the United States, but all an enormous presumed imbalance lubricated by very free flows of capital from the savers into the consumers. Uh, but it was a very unsustainable pattern that persisted long enough to create extremes in financial markets that have contributed to and complicated this adjustment. And the markets have certainly become global, as <laughs> those remarks some decades ago suggested. It's not the first time we've had global markets, but certainly the depth, particularly in the financial area of the interconnections uh, between markets say between markets, it became one global market in important respects and with modern communications and technology and developments in financial markets very closely interconnected to an extent that had not been true before. And then there were what I think of as technical elements, securitization. We've moved from a, a uh, economic system, a financial system in this country, uh, which remains at the center of things, where 20, 30 years ago, banks were still dominant. They accounted for 60 percent or more of credit creation to a situation where the banks have gone from 60 percent or more to 20 to 30 percent. And what I will call the open markets done exactly the opposite, going from 30 percent to 70 percent, at least before this crisis. And that has led to, I think, certain vulnerabilities uh, you have the development of securitization, subprime mortgages, subprime, a lot of other lending, I'm afraid, credit default swaps that were not heard of back in 1989 became prominent in this particular uh, situation. In other words, enormous complications uh, gave rise to, in a, in a situation that uh, facilitated contagion, not just within the United States, but around the world. And when one talks about 
unique circumstances, I have never seen, none of us has ever seen, a decline in economic activity at the rate of speed that happened after last September in this country. And what made it really unique, it was not just in this country, but within a few weeks or months, it became an almost worldwide phenomenon. So that the whole industrialized world is in recession. And in fact, we will have a decline in economic activity. We are having a decline in economic activity in the whole world that's been unprecedented, at least since the 1930s. Now, why did all this happen? I suggested some of the background factors. And there are a lot of culprits. I picked up this report on the way down. It's an interesting report since I had something to do with creating it for the G30, discussing uh, the implications of this crisis for financial reform. And it goes through, like everybody else, uh, with all the reasons this happened, excessive exuberance, leading to enormous leverage in banking and other financial markets, undoubtedly regulatory weaknesses, gaps in regulatory coverage were exposed, enormous failures of risk management in our big financial institutions. You know, when I began in banking in the 1950s, the banks had something called uh, credit departments and credit training programs, and they were very intense. I think you will be hard pressed to find a big bank now that has important credit training programs, which is a symptom of change. And why did that happen? Because we had this phenomena of, uh, I'm inclined to say misbegotten phenomena of financial engineering. We had an influx, credit analysts went out, mathematicians came in. I'm not sure that was a good, good trade. Uh, but we had people who applied sophisticated mathematical techniques to the behavior of financial markets. And you know, uh, they had a great story to tell uh, that they would, as the expression goes, slice and dice. We will uh, chop up risk. We will make arrangements in various devices, new devices, so that those risks are born for those who are eager to take them. And those that do not want much risk can shovel off the risk to others. It will all be dispersed, and we will not have any crises. Well, that was clearly a false god. I think we sliced and diced and got a lot of risk concentrated in the, in the process. But uh, you look at all this together, and I like to summarize the, the problems in uh, the oldest of human instincts, greed and hubris. And the greed and the hubris were fed in these particular circumstances by these two, two factors, I think, they were supercharged by the compensation practices that arose in recent years that led to uh, seeming rewards for risk, all out of scale with anything we've been familiar with before. And you had the risk on the one side, the compensation practices on the other side, and then the feeling that through the wonders of financial engineering, the risks would be absorbed and diffused in a way that would not create serious problems. Well, it turned out that I'm afraid that both of those things were false gods and that we ended up with rewards for risk way beyond prudence. And at the end of the day, we have a problem. I emphasize that one result is a worldwide recession began in the United States. I think without any doubt, people like to, uh, in other countries, take a little schadenfreude and say, uh, see, this whole Anglo-Saxon American-centered system of finance has broken down. Well, in fact, it had spread pretty well elsewhere in the world, and it's broken down uh, everywhere. I was at a conference earlier this week, and somebody pointed out, you know, what's that expression? God saves children, something else in the United States. And they pointed out, here it is true. This time, the United States was the epicenter of the crisis. It had the deepest crisis in the beginning. It is the most extended financially, 
has uh, potentially certainly the most overextended currency internationally. And what happens, the rest of the world is in deeper recession than the United States, and the U.S. dollar goes up. So God saves the United States in the middle of uh, all this. But I don't know how long that uh, lasts. We are in, I think, not a Great Depression, but we're in a Great Recession for sure. And uh, at this stage, it's uh, hard to see that we're going to have any very, very rapid recovery. I do think with uh, the massive injection of money, guarantees, government support in so many directions, in the United States and elsewhere, the financial system is pretty well protected. I'm inclined to say it's protected, but comatose. And it's not quite comatose, but it's on life support. And while it's nice to have it protected, and I don't think we face an imminent financial crisis in the sense of great failures, it is not a vibrant financial system, and that works against a good, strong recovery, and of course, a lack of a good, strong recovery works against uh, a strong financial system because those uh, difficult and bad credits continue to mount up as the recession continues. So it does look like rather a long slog in terms of recovery, even though I think there's a good reason to think that the rate of decline is going to slow and level off, and you could have some small increases. But what to do, and that's what this conference is all about, and I will retreat shortly and let the young experts tell you what to do about it. But it's going to be a subject of discussion, not just here, but in the halls of Congress and debate in the administration and all the rest. And let me just give you a few thoughts in that connection. It's clear there are going to be major regulatory and market changes in store. They're already underway. One admonition I would make is that we ought to take time to think this through in a comprehensive way as we can before we begin making uh, big changes. There is a temptation to act quickly, I understand it, and deal with this particular problem or that particular problem, but I think we find pretty rapidly that if we deal with some important part of the problem, that will affect other parts of the system, and maybe in ways you didn't expect, so you better sit down and take enough time to try to figure out a way to approach this more comprehensively. So that would be my uh, first admonition. Now, of course, as soon as one says that, let's think about it comprehensively. Uh, okay, let's think. Uh, how do we want this system to develop? And I think I'm going to make a distinction clearer than it really is in practice. But I think there is a distinction that can be made as to what kind of a financial system we want. And I will put the two opposing schools of thought, so to speak, as simply as do we want a bank-oriented system, commercial bank-oriented system, or do we want an open market-oriented system? And it's the latter, of course, which the tendency in the past 20, 30 years is, has exemplified. And has that been a good pattern? Do we want to support it? Or do we want to, to some degree, go back to what would have been taken for granted 20 or 30 years ago of a bank-centered system? I think there is a lot to be said for the idea of a bank-centered system. I think this crisis has demonstrated quite clearly that while banks have been reduced in the provision of credit to the economy, when troubles began, you had to deal with the banks and the banks were going to be, in a sense, the savior of the system uh, through the government support and assistance and defense that are still at the core of the system. The banks are there. They still have custody over the payment system, over the infrastructure of financial markets, and they are in a position to still provide a good part of the credit supply of the country. Now, what's the distinction I'm making? What is the difference between a bank and a hedge fund? 
I have heard uh, no people in the market say, and I understand it, that there is no distinction anymore. We're all hedge funds. Well, I'm not sure I want to accept that characterization. The banking system, as I see it, historically and even now, should be directed toward a service relationship with clients a relationship-oriented approach. A service approach has certain fiduciary implications, but they're there to serve individuals, they're there to serve businesses, big businesses, small businesses, they're there to serve governments, they're there to make international transactions, to operate the payment system, as I said, do very fundamental things for the economy, and it has traditionally been protected if you take this point of view, you continue to protect it. But I don't want to protect everybody. If I don't want to protect everybody, maybe I ought to make a distinction between banks and the rest of the system, which I will call the market-oriented system, a transaction-oriented system. A hedge fund does not care today in making a transaction whether the guy he makes that transaction with is going to be back there tomorrow. There's no customer relationship. There's no continuity in the relationship, and I think that is a different, it's not bad, it's not a question of good or bad, it's different. And I would argue, I think, that the new system ought to recognize that distinction and provide a certain protection, as it always has, for the banking system, but try to avoid protection for those very large capital market oriented system. So you're not protecting everybody. Now that has a lot of, I don't want to protect all the banks either, but that's a different problem. Uh, they are going to have access to the so-called safety net. Now how we do all that, of course, raises uh, a lot of questions, and I'm not going to get into them now. We can discuss it a little bit later. But it obviously has uh, very big implications for how you regulate the system and the role of the different agencies that we have today and the agencies we'll have in the future, I find myself uh, rather sympathetic to the idea that was advanced by Secretary Paulson a year or two ago, and which is implemented in some countries abroad of making a distinction between uh, regulation for prudential purposes, for safety and soundness, are consistent with what I just said would be largely directed toward banks and what I will call business practices covering consumer affairs, uh, the normal things that the SEC has done in terms of uh, transparency, uh, securities registration, sec control of the practices of investment banks and others, an important area of supervision but not at the core of safety and soundness. So make a distinction between those two functions, two functions that have been very much mixed up in the current regulatory structure. And I think it would lend clarity and, and be useful to separate them out. And then finally, and the last point I, I want to make, is you can avoid, I think, uh, consideration of the role of the Federal Reserve in all this. Now, somebody in the position of Dewey Dane, in the position that I was once in, the last thing you wanted to do was open up the Federal Reserve Act, because you never knew what would happen once that happened, and whether the essential elements of the Federal Reserve, and particularly its independence within the political process, uh, would be challenged. Well, I think for better or worse, we are at the point where the Federal Reserve Act, after all that's been happening in the last year or more, is going to be reviewed. I don't think the political system will tolerate the degree of activity that the Federal Reserve, in conjunction with the Treasury, has undertaken, in conjunction with the administration, the amount of money that has been put at risk, understandably, for good reason, but that is bound to lead to a review of what the appropriate division of 
responsibilities is in the federal government and the appropriate role for the Federal Reserve. And once that is opened, and this is opened in a fairly fundamental sense, it will be very interesting to see what the role of the Federal Reserve will be in the future and how its basic independence can be defended. Now, I'm not going to describe I have some ideas of how that must be done. I'm sure everybody in this room can have some ideas of how it should be done. But they range all the way from giving the Federal Reserve much more supervisory and regulatory responsibility to largely taking away the supervisory and regulatory responsibility from the Federal Reserve. I suspect we'll probably end up somewhere between those extremes. But this is just an indication of how wide open that question is likely to be and why, to return to my initial point, I think we want to consider this thing pretty calmly over a period of time in a way that we can take account of the whole new system that we want instead of kind of hit or miss legislation in particular areas. So with that much, let me sit down and uh, let people who are more in the midst of the, the conflict than I am tell you what really should be done or what has been done. I, uh, Look at my two friends here from experience in the Federal Reserve to uh, uh, take up the conversation, and then we maybe can respond and have a little conversation among ourselves. So thank you very much. Will you take some yeah, you want to do it later? I can do it now or later. What? <laughs> well, I don't want to uh, take time away from my extreme colleagues here. Yeah, but. <laughs> I have a question. Just, just as a quick observation, I think your concluding comments are exactly right. The key is going to be how not to damage what the Federal Reserve does well in this transition and to keep our fingers crossed. I have a more specific question that comes out of the, uh, the G30 report that you were involved in. accounting system and the accounting rules really transparently report information uh, to, uh, to help the system. And uh, as you know, uh, BASB recently uh, made some adjustments. One of those adjustments was to change uh, the rules for other than temporary impairment, BAS 115. And uh, the American Banking Association agrees with what was ha happened there. But one of the results was Citibank's report yesterday, and as a result of that change, I think, uh, uh, there was a statement that uh, there's a, uh, uh, a 600, over $600 million gain uh, in income immediately and over $400 million gain in retained earnings, fixing some of the impairment reports from the fourth quarter. They reverse some of the stuff they've done? It's a, bi a, billion, dollars, a billion dollar plus swing. And I, I think that's probably appropriate if you really want to make sure that impairment really only re reflects cash flows, uh, it reflects real credit flows. This, this indicates uh, how the accounting system itself is uh, affecting the perception of what's going on in the market and, and, and what's going on in business. No, your, your point is very relevant. Uh, and it's an area that I've increasingly been concerned with. You know, I was the chairman of the International Accounting Standards Committee uh, when it was created eight or ten years ago to create international standards. and the committee of which I was chairman appointed the board, which did the technical work. And part of the purpose and the ideology surrounding all this, I don't know why I get involved in these institutions, but the independent status of the accounting uh, standard set is should be maintained against political pressures. I thought I was back in the Federal Reserve, but it's the same, uh, same kind of thing. Uh, and what, we, what I was reinforced in my own thinking, how, how conceptually and practically difficult accounting is in today's world. I mean, accountants, you know, were considered second-class citizens. I think they had an inferiority complex with the lawyers making all the money and investment bankers making all the money and, and accountants laboring in the vineyard 
even economists were doing better than, than accountants. Well, now we find out the accountants are, it's a very tough intellectual exercise as well as a practical exercise. And I do think it's important to maintain the independence of the uh, standard setters, and it is important to internationalize it. We're going to have a global financial system. What is more important than having a global, globally accepted uh, accounting standards, which is why I got involved in the thing in the first place. Now we've had this crisis, and I, what I think are weaknesses in the uh, extreme mark-to-market uh, fair value, so-called, approach are, are exposed. Uh, I was very frustrated because I never liked the full-scale application of it, but I was told to shut up because I was not supposed to opine on technical matters while I was... Uh, now I can opine, so I will opine. Uh, I, I don't know the answer in any... I won't pretend to know the answer in any definitive sense. But I do think in the kind of disturbed situation you have and did have in markets uh, where it was hard to know the value of complex instruments, uh, pushing mark-to-market -market accounting to an extreme is a mistake because it can lead to cascading declines in, in valuations. And it certainly led to inconsistencies among institutions. But beyond that, I think there is a more fundamental problem. Is mark-to-market -market accounting really consistent with uh, the traditional kind of banking system, and I could say insurance companies and pension funds as well, all regulated institutions that perform a vital economic function of transferring maturity and credit differences into a practical money-making operation. Uh, they are intermediaries. And you can't intermediate if you can't take any maturity differentials or if you can't take any credit risk. I'm exaggerating a bit, but market-to-market -market accounting forces you not to take maturity risk, not to take credit risk, and everything becomes very volatile in the open market, which is what was happening. And does that degree of volatility really serve the economic interest in stable and orderly economic growth? And I think the answer to that is no, projected over the whole financial system. So what's that lead me to? That yes, there is a reason to have an accounting system that recognizes the needs and importance of intermediation in credit markets by regulated institutions. And I emphasize the regulated institutions because the accountants love market-to-market -market accounting because they say it can't be so easily messed around with by managers who will distort their reporting to suit their purposes. And I think there's a valid concern. So, but when I'm talking about regulated financial institutions, Presumably the regulators can help safeguard the integrity of the reporting process. Now let me take the simplest example that bothers a lot of people. Strict application of mark to market fair value. You cannot reserve against a loan loss unless you know what the loan loss is. By the time you really know what the loan loss is, it's too, too late to reserve against it. So you have banks as a practical matter, unable to make orderly provisions over a period of time against uh, the prospect that normally happens is they're going to run into periods where they have high losses and you want to protect against it. The accountants say, no, wait till it comes and then take your loss. I don't, that is an example, I think, of what is not very consistent in terms of maintaining a kind of healthy banking system. So. That's a long-winded answer, <laughs> but I think there is a serious problem here. I, I'm hopeful the, the international people are reviewing this, thank God, they resisted it for a long time. They're being pushed by political forces. FASB was brutally pushed by political forces to make some changes on the fly. Uh, the international people tell me they finally are really rethinking this. Now, I don't know how 
fundamental, but they want to come up with something different by the end of the year, which is, a, I think, a reasonable approach. What about the uh, the operate? Well, I'm going to delegate my answer to Mr. Stern, who's uh, <laughs> the world's greatest expert, who uh, has written a book or two on the subject. Uh, with all respect to Mr. Stern, I'm not sure he's answered the question fully uh, <laughs> satisfactorily, because I don't think anybody has. But I, I think we could all kind of agree that there's too much of it, uh, and part of the consideration in the reform ought to be how we minimize it, not how we maximize it. And I think there is some danger in some of the some of the um, reform proposals that would suggest or imply that there will be a group of institutions that even more certainly will be protected from failure for whatever reason. But I understand the pressures in that direction, but I would like it if we could reverse the process a little bit and reduce uh, the incentives to save a failing institution, even a large, systemically relevant institution. But one step is to get an easier resolution process for non-banks, which is something that's being worked on. But it's one of the reasons why I like this distinction I made between uh, service-oriented banks and the rest of the market, because I would hope we could avoid a situation by regulation or otherwise that non-banks become subject to the too-big-to-fail doctrine. Um, we caught, caught in a big insurance company, obviously. There's got to be a change in insurance company regulation. But I bring them within you know, more or less the defended scope. But I don't want to get hedge funds, equity funds, others getting very large and then getting in trouble to the point where the government feels they have to support them. <laughs>